Whew. I commend all of you for dropping in on a Friday afternoon, honestly. I feel like it's just one of those times. I, I've spent the whole day thinking it was Saturday, despite, you know, working and having university. <laughs> it's my whole body clock has just shifted so incorrectly over the last, like, month. My God. Y'all are on holidays right now, right? God, that makes oh, that makes it so much worse. My body picked the doggest time to <laughs> give me a sore throat. Literally dying. Okay. 1.30. Let's get started. So today, well, well, first of all, welcome to the Skyline Exam Revision Series for Business Management this time round. Um, my name is Jasmine. I'll do a little bit of an intro um, to myself in a bit, but I mean, welcome, welcome here. I want to make your time here worth it as much as possible. It's really, really important that come September, September is like when we really start to get into exam revision and October is, October is exam month, really. Like you'll have swap back during, actually you might, your swap back might be um, leading a bit into November because term four got pushed back a couple of weeks. You guys are a little bit out of whack to what normally happens, but that's the way it goes and nothing really changes. So first of all, just, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Jasmine. Um, it's good to see you all. I just want to do a quick a quick little thank you to UBS. They're the sponsors for today. And if you've been to any of the other Skyline series, you would have heard this already, but UBS are the ones who are backing up Skyline with this initiative and being able to supply you guys with these various series. So we're really, really thankful to them. Um, and we have Dim from Skyline today, and he'll be covering one of our, cont our contemporary case study for today for a little bit. But basic Zoom etiquette stuff, basic, how I really like want this to work is I am totally fine with people asking questions all throughout. I, if you have the raised hand icon, that'd be great. Um, like just let me know in advance or type it straight into the chat. I really, I'm really not fussed at all, but the one thing I want to emphasize is while I'm here, ask questions. Like seriously, I think don't don't waste the, don't waste the opportunity. Um, I don't think I just realized, yo, I don't think I did an intro slide to myself. Yo, okay. Well, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Jasmine. I I graduated from Doncaster Secondary in 2017. I don't know if that rings any bells for anyone, um, Donny Gang, but. I got a 49 in business management in 2017 and I got a 45 in English as well and a 95.65 ATAR. Um, so that was, hopefully you can trust me as we go through all of these notes. I have a fair bit of experience in lecturing business management. Um, I was, literally did a, a lecture this morning on this subject. So hopefully you can definitely trust me. This is like the agenda for today and it is going to be a little bit adaptive, I suppose, to what we decide to spend more time on versus what we decide to go faster through. It ultimately comes down to, you know, what you guys would prefer and that's fine. We will be having breaks. My God, we will be having breaks. Three hours is a long time. Um, mainly what we're going to do is focus on, I'll grab up my highlighter, a revision of unit three is going to take up uh, uh, really just the bulk of today because unit three is the largest unit. Unit four got pretty decimated by the 2020 study design update. So there's not as much to go through with unit four as there normally would be. We will do a Kahoot though. Um, so yes, unit three, then unit four revision will lead into a contemporary case study as well. Um, and just use that as a reminder to have contemporary case studies for everything that you learn today. And we'll have a bunch of time at the end, basically just dedicated to, to questions, yeah? And exam prep just in general. First of all, 
you know, um, pay, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are gathered on and pay respect to elders past and present. One thing that I would like to just quickly show before we get started into the actual bulk of Bizman is this quick video. Yo, I hope to God I, I shared the screen with the, um, the sound enabled. If it's not, it's not. Um, this is a quick video from um, a student who was helped up by Skyline a few years back and she just recorded this um, for herself just to kind of describe what Skyline does. So here it goes. Please, audio work. Hi, I'm Maddie and I'm a third year cadet uh, in global markets at UBS in the cash equities division. And I am a third year student studying at the University of Sydney, um, double majoring in financial maths and statistics and English. At school, maths and English were my favourite subjects, so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to continue studying them after school. And I also look forward to sharing what I've learned and my study skills with you guys um, at Skyline. I know Year 12 can be very tricky um, for many, including myself, but the main thing is to try your best, work hard, listen to your teachers, ask any questions to fill gaps in your knowledge and you'll just, you'll, you won't have any regrets. You'll just be incredibly proud with what you um, can prove to yourself and what you achieve. Right. Oh, I do have an intro slide. Oh my God, after all that. Anyways, yeah, I'm Jasmine, 45 in biz, nine in biz man, 45 in English. And I'm doing a Bachelor of Agriculture at the moment, like farming and, and cows and all that sort of stuff down at Unimel. Now, for today, the most important thing to lead off with is an understanding of the VCAR study design as a whole. So Bizman has three key areas of study, yes? all dedicated under unit three or unit four. Now, if you're studying on your own and you're not sure about whether a certain amount of, a certain type of information is required or what key skills and task words apply to those things, like there's always debate about, uh, yo, do I need to know um, similarities and differences between these two things? Do I need to know how to evaluate this thing? All information is taken straight from the study design. So what you guys should always do if you're concerned about whether or not a certain certain knowledge is relevant or a certain task word could apply to certain knowledge is actually suss out the study design. So that's a screenshot from area of study one. All of the key knowledge here, this is everything that's examinable, yeah? This is everything that should guide you when it comes to exam revision. And what I suggest is when you are revising your notes and doing practice exams in the earlier stages, so like now, go through and tick off all of the information that you know so that you can identify and target the, the knowledge that you don't yet know or haven't revised properly yet. Yeah, because you need to know everything here. Everything in that key knowledge section is up for grabs on the exam. We also have key skills. This is like forgotten. And this is so important for us to understand. It's task words. It's words like compare, evaluate, discuss, propose and justify. All of those things that are really important to understand fundamentally before we go into the exam where we'll be seeing no task words everywhere. This exam is, excuse, sorry, I'm just shuffling the zoom over. This exam is on the 16th of November at 3 p.m. So we're like a solid, slightly less than two months away. Um, a little bit scary. For this exam, it's two hours of writing time, 15 minutes reading, and we'll always have a total of 75 marks. Now, the number of questions for each section it changes year to year. I don't know. I don't know why they flip flop, but like 2017, it was like this. It was six marks per. 2018, they downed it to five, and then 2019, they went back up to six. So they flip flop a little bit between the number of questions, but overall, it will still be worth 75 marks in total. We have two sections split across this exam. The biggest one is section A. Section A is worth by far the bulk of the marks. It's 50 out of 75 of your marks in total. And it also contains the 10 mark question, which is another reason why it's big. This section A, 
these questions are going to be very, very similar to the ones that you're already used to because they're very much normal SAC questions. You're going to have standalone-ish questions and small case study questions. And you, yeah, this is basically just what I mean. This was um, from the 2018 exam. Explain the importance of leadership and change management in your response, refer to a case study. Quick standalone question, or you could be given those smaller case studies and have questions A, B, C, D that refer back to that case study. Section B is where things get a little bit more important to understand because there's a specific rule with section B and it's that all of your answers to the, to the questions in section B must be applied to the case study that they give you for this section. Vicar will give you a case study. It'll be a page, maybe a page and a half. It's always fake, like it's never a real business. In 2017, it was a shareholder report. 2018, it was an article. Like it's, it changes every year. But the most important thing to understand is that all of the questions in section B are going to relate back to that case study that they give you. In 2019, it looked like this. It was like the biggest one they gave. Um, we had a map, we had a KPI table. The thing with these, these case studies is barely any of it, any of it is actually relevant. Um, if you go through and just use a highlighter and pick out the important info, there's not a whole lot of important info. A lot of it is just there to kind of fill the page. <laughs> so I suggest um, when you do begin section B, going through this case study and identifying those important aspects. And again, if we look at 2018, 2018 is the same. It's like so big, but so much of that information is just kind of dud. Right? We're looking for the important things within this case study. Now, I like to lead off these discussions with an establishment of how important the exam is in terms of maximizing your study score at the end of the day. So anyone who's done a VCE subject before, sorry, year 12 subject before, would be pretty familiar with this. When you finish your subject and VCAR send out your results, you get given three letter grades, right? You get one for your unit three sacks, you get one for your unit four sacks, and then one for your exam performance. And then all of those together create your study score. Now, the thing is, to understand with all of this, your exam score is much more important than your SAC scores. And the reason for that is because all of you guys, like I, I would assume a lot of you guys are from different schools. Your schools would have given you different SACs. Your teachers are all different, have different expectations. And so there's always a bit of variation. You know, I could go to one school and get 80% and then another school and get 100% on the same SAC. Because of that, VCAR will take the exam and your performance on the exam is like the true equalizer between everyone in the... So you really need to do well on the exam because it's like considered your, the, your true understanding of the subject. So if we have two students, we have student A and we have student B. Student A did pretty good on the SAC, not outstanding, couple B pluses, look pretty good, but then they nailed the exam, right? They got a solid A plus. Let's say it was a really high A plus. They were right up there. Then student B, on the other hand, did really well on the SACs. Solid A plus average, we love that. And then they flubbed the exam a bit, yeah? C plus, certainly not what they would have been expecting for their exam performance, not great. Now, even though technically the average of student B is bigger, student A is going to end up with the higher exam score. And the reason is because a high exam score is going to pull your study score up, whereas a low exam score is going to drag your study score down. And so that becomes important, not just for people who want to improve their study score, but if you're one of these people on the side and you, you've gotten pretty well on the SACs, um, maybe you've gotten consistent A's or something like that, if you flub the exam and you say, say you have an average of A, A, and then you get a C, your score is going to drag down a lot, right? So you need to work at maintaining and exceeding 
whatever scores you had in the SAC. Really important. And that's why the final exam is the most important part of this. It's why you have to put in so much effort and you have to come to these three hour um, revision series and do all your practice exams. It's because you really need to nail this exam. And that's the same for all of the subjects. Now we're gonna go into unit three and this is like about an hour-ish on this. I'll try to keep it relatively brief. I don't want to want to kill you guys with my voice. We have three areas of study, right? Business foundations, managing employees and operations. Now, because unit four has been pretty um, cut down, we've lost like a solid third of unit four. There's gonna be more questions than usual on topics from unit three. So it's really important that we throw ourselves back into old knowledge and revise all of these topics really in depth. Here are all the topics from this study design, from this study design, from this area of study. Yeah. Now today we're not going to cover everything because that's impossible, but we will focus most of our energy on topics that haven't been asked about on an exam yet. Right. When I say yet, I mean since 2017. 2017 was the first year of this new study design. So 2017, 18, 19, 20. Yo, if they don't ask something after four years, then what was the point of even putting it on the study design? These things had better show up. Corporate culture technically showed up last year, but it was only within a 10 marker. And it was nothing to do with things like official and real and strategies for it to, its development. So we hardly counts. Okay, let's lead off with types of businesses. With each type of business, there are a couple things I really want you to focus on. First of all, with sole trader and partnership, the key word for sole trader is owned. And that came up in 2017. Yeah, 2017 students were asked to define a shareholder, sorry, a sole trader. And if they did not include the word owned, they didn't get the mark. Partnership. In 2018, it was a two mark define and the two things that you needed to include, right? So in two mark defines, you get one mark for one element and then one mark for the second element. And the two elements for partnership were one, the word owned, and two, saying that it's between two to 20 people. Picard didn't accept up to 20. They said it had to be exactly two to 20 people. Private limited companies, we had that on last year's exam. It was like outline the characteristics or something. And here were some of the characteristics they said. It had to be one to 50 shareholders, limited liability and perpetuity. Now, limited liability just means it's a separate legal entity from its owners or its shareholders. And perpetuity means that if the owner dies, the business is still going to continue. It will still live past the... Um, the owner if they choose if they leave or pass away public listed companies 50 plus shareholders okay limited liability just like a private company perpetuity just like a private company but unlike a private company it's listed on the australian stock exchange and that just means that if i wanted to i could close this powerpoint down and go buy shares in like I, what's a public company I can't even come up with one at the top of my head. Bunnings. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think that's a public company. Social enterprise. The one thing I really just want you to understand is it is not distributing profits to the community. It is distributing them to a community cause. In 2018, if kids didn't say cause, then they didn't get the mark. It's really petty, but that's how VCAR decided it would go. Government business enterprise. All the profits are returned to the government. That's the main thing. But in terms of the main purpose of a government, of a GBE, it's mainly there to provide a service. Like Ozpost is a good example of a GBE. Ozpost is not a very profitable company, but we need it. So the government's like, yeah, okay, we need it. We'll pay for it to make sure it's always there. But, um, and therefore all the profits of Ozpost return to the government. Now, two that you really need to study are public listed companies and GBEs. And the reason I say that is because the other four have come up on past exams. In fact, every year for the past three years, the first question on the exam has been related to 
types of businesses, right? It's always been a, it's always been two marks regarding one of the types of businesses. And to study any, study those two because if they break their streak now, that's just tragic. Now let's talk a bit about management styles. These, this is a really important topic because it also expands into a couple of the other topics in this area of um, area of the study design. Yeah. Now, it's all good and it's all well and good to know their definitions, but I like to characterize management styles based on two key characteristics. The first of which is the direction of communication. So, autocratic and persuasive. Remember, those are the ones where it's it's the it's the top, the manager is the top dog. They're the ones calling the shots and they just tell people, right? They make the decision and they just speak down and they tell the employees what they have to do. The only difference is persuasive. They will also explain the reason behind their decision. Consultative and participative, a bit different. We've actually got two-way communication where employees input and ideas, you know, they're encouraged to share them, yeah? And laissez-faire is the odd one out because laissez-faire is horizontal communication. And that's just because in laissez-faire, managers are out of the picture, right? Managers are not there. Um, the manager is just like, yo, here's your due date. Do whatever you want. And then the, the employees are kind of left to figure it out. So no manager, just communication between employees. And the second characteristic is decision-making power. Decision-making power is centralized for autocratic, persuasive, and consultative. Consultative management is the one people forget because even though the manager is asking the employees for their opinions, they're consulting the employees, the manager is still the one making the final decision. Participative, everyone takes a vote and has equal decision-making power. And then let's say fair, there's no manager. <laughs> so yeah, it's decentralized. The employees are the only ones making decisions. Now, really important because like I mentioned, this has not appeared on a study, to, oh, sorry, on an exam question yet. You have to evaluate the appropriateness of management styles using these four characteristics. The first one, nature of the task, we're looking at the particular decision that has to be undertaken. So if I, if my business was going crap, and I had to make drastic cost cutting decisions. And I go, okay, look, we have to make people redundant. We have to get rid of some employees. You know, we're just struggling so badly. If I'm using participative management, equal decision-making power, what employee is gonna throw a hand and be like, yes, I agree. I also vote for me to lose my job. No one, yeah? So participative wouldn't work in some scenarios, nature of the task, time. Time is important because two-way communication, so participative and consultative and especially laissez-faire, you just talk, you just talk. There's so much talking, there's negotiation, there's debate. It takes a lot of time to use those strategies. Whereas autocratic and persuasive decision gets made, decision gets communicated down quick. Experience of employees, it depends on whether you have new ones or old ones. If you have old employees who have been around for 20 years, chances are they know what they're talking about and you can trust them with decision-making power. However, if I just hired three new people and I'm like, hi guys, make this decision for us, you have decision-making power, chances are they're not gonna make the most informed and effective decisions. And then lastly is manager preference. So this is just, you have a good, you're, you might be a good decision maker or you might be a good communicator and like have good interpersonal skills or you could just genuinely a, a, a prefer one over the other. Now, what we'll do is a quick activity here. You have a little case study and what I want you to do is using all four of those areas of appropriateness, I want you to try and justify which management style that, what's her name, Ellie, should use in this situation, okay? You don't have to, you can just like literally note it down on your phone, does not have to be a full length answer or anything. 
but I really want you to think about which strategy, so which strategy, which style would best suit her according to these four key characteristics. Does that make sense? So what I think I'll do is give you guys, let's say, let's say four minutes to do this one. I really don't care about a full length answer. I just want you to think through those four things and just have an answer of which management style you think is best. Does that make sense? And then we'll go through which ones would probably be the most appropriate. So I'll start a four minute timer on my phone. We'll do that. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk through an answer together. All righty. I'm going to shut off my video while I do that. Bang, there we go. Four minute timer started. I'll give you updates as we move throughout the timer. Actually, I'm gonna switch my video on. I feel weird without it on. <gasps> I have a typo, shoot. Access to the lecture slides, yes. Yeah, so how it works is at the end of the lecture, there's like a link to an evaluation survey type of thing. And upon completion of that, you get the um, slides sent out to you. Does that make sense? Sorry, I should have dropped that in at the start of the class. Thank you for reminding me. Awesome almost halfway through with that one. minute left and then we'll just have a chat about which ones would probably be the most suitable. There's multiple answers to this one, by the way, like it's fine if you have, get it down to two and you're like, I don't know which one of the two is better. I just swallowed a whole river down my lung. <laughs> Jesus. Whew. Yo, so that's four minutes up. 
even if we didn't get through all of those points, it's totally okay. I just wanted to give us practice on thinking about these four different elements. So if we continue forward, here are our five different management styles. Now in this situation, there are a few that we, we might kick off, kick, kick out of the line first. Right. So if we're considering these five options, I would say that the first ones we get rid of from which one we would justify, probably autocratic and persuasive, okay? Because in this situation, we have a lot of experienced employees. It specifically says it, they've been here for like 10 years. We should be using them. We should be giving them the opportunity to share their ideas with management. We also have an inexperienced manager on the other side, yeah? So we probably don't want to have them be making the decision without any help. I'm just wondering, of these three, there's kind of one that we would kick off. Is Does anyone have an idea about which of these three would probably be the least appropriate? It kind of just comes down to, it's not even just, necessarily the characteristics of it it's more about sorry i just opened the chat sometimes my chat just like doesn't work what is up with that yo <laughs> come on well okay thanks zoom real appreciated okay let's pretend that i was able to see what you guys typed thank you for typing that we would knock off laissez-faire, okay? That would be the, the one we'd knock off just because laissez-faire is only used in certain industries, very, very creative driven industries like fashion and technology. It just, it's such a unique type of management style that we often just don't see it much in real life. And that leaves us with consultative or participative. Oops, honestly, it doesn't really matter which, doesn't, don't mind too much. Nature of the task, the task itself would benefit from a lot of collaboration and, and detailed discussion, right? Because it's an important one. It's, it's policy. It's important. We should be speaking about it and ironing out the details. We have enough time. It kind of specifies that it's not an urgent situation. We have employees who are more experienced than Ellie, the manager, correct? So suitable in this scenario. And then manager preference, the manager herself is inexperienced, so it probably doesn't suit her too well. That's how that all works. Now, with the management skills, I don't want to talk about what they are, right? That's more something that you, you can literally just open a textbook and read the definition. I more want to focus on the next dot point on the study design, which is their relationship with management styles. This is its own dot point. So it's really important that we learn this. We'll spotlight persuasive and consultative management. And what that means is I want to talk about which ones, which skills would be the most important for those management styles. So persuasive, looking at persuasive. Obviously, these aren't all of the important ones, but I'm just, I'm just bringing up three three skills that are important. One, communicating, because you need to clearly explain your instructions. Otherwise, employees don't know what they're doing. You need to clearly articulate tasks to employees so that they, again, understand everything that they have to do for their job. And a persuasive manager is the only decision maker. So they'd best be good at it or they're going to be making very rough decisions. Consultative, on the other hand, much more communication, like two-way communication driven, because we've got a situation where you're trying to, everyone's sharing their ideas, everyone's voices is encouraged. So as a manager, you want to make sure you motivate this team of people and really try to align everyone to a shared goal. That's where leading comes in. Interpersonal. One thing that's important is that a consultative manager is going to need to learn how to reject people's input. Um, you know, I, I hear you, but like, I'm going to go with this decision instead, that type of thing. That requires interpersonal skill. And then communicating, obviously, it's two-way communication. You need to be able to listen to the people talking to you as well as talk back to them. Last topic, corporate culture, the shared set of beliefs, values, and 
attitudes held by those in a business, the key word I want you to take away from this definition is shared. Yeah. Shared is a really, really important word when it comes to defining corporate culture. Now it can be real or it can be official. These definitions are just mainly here for you. Like when you get this emailed out to you, you can come back and look at this if you want. But for real, actual and established are good words to use and official stated and documented are good words to use. I also recommend doing things like this. So as reflected by workplace behaviours, um, it shows an extra level of understanding of what real corporate culture is. And then likewise with official, saying things like as reflected by documentation, such as the mission and vision statements of the business, anything like that really helps flesh out and show the examiner that you understand what these concepts are. Here are some strategies to help develop corporate culture. Now, as I said, this hasn't been asked about yet. So I do recommend knowing, I would say two of these minimum. And the ones I would suggest would probably be, the easiest ones would probably be this and rituals and management style. Those would probably be the easiest to remember. You know, the management style you have is a big influencer on the culture of a business. As you can imagine, a participative business would have a very different culture to an autocratic business. Rituals, I know that sounds a little bit like satanic, but that just means things like birthday parties, going out for drinks on a Friday night, all that type of stuff. You can't, the strategy can't be go out for drinks. The strategy is rituals such as going out for drinks on a Friday night, yeah? And the management setting the right example for what type of culture they want. Now, let's move on to managing employees. In terms of topics that haven't appeared on a study design yet, these are the ones we'll focus on. We have performance management being the main thing here, okay? Performance management is a big topic. You need to know how to um, evaluate them as well. So I suggest if you're going to study anything in detail, you study this one in detail. Really, really important. Now, key skills, I had a chat about that at the start, but what we're going to do is go through the key skills that apply to this area of study because the one, the key skills for the first area of study aren't very spicy. It's pretty much just describe, define, discuss, like it's kind of basic, whereas this one has a bit more spice. Um, first of all, technically anything in this area of study can be discussed, and that's actually true for like the whole study design. Obviously, not everything is discussable. Not everything has advantages and disadvantages. But for things that do, you really do need to learn them. Compare and evaluate strategies for motivation and training. That's asking you to be able to compare motivation strategies and training options. There was actually a question in um, the 2017 exam I believe it was comparing, I, I could be mistaking it for a discussion. It was either discuss or compare training options. But yes, certainly it's available for VCAR to ask you. Research and analyze case studies. Yo, this is like the biggest thing with, with, your, with BizMan and I get it. Case studies, you do need to know them for pretty much every topic on the exam, which is tough. There's a lot of different case studies potentially for you to learn, but really important. Last year, kids got asked a case study related to motivation theories and motivation strategies. Those are so hard to come up with case studies for. So a lot of kids just didn't really prepare for that one. So make sure that you're really preparing for those case studies. We'll go through one today. Propose and justify strategies. In 2018, this applied to awards or agreements. You had to propose and justify which one would best suit their situation. And then lastly, emphasis is put on applying the theories of motivation. So that's what you should be prepared to do. Now, quick discussion on how managing employees links with business objectives. Sorry, I am, ugh, I do not sit properly on my chair. Effective management of employees kind of has two branches to it. And we'll talk about the first one first. The first branch is motivated employees employees who are willing to expend energy and effort into completing a job or a task. Yeah, that's what motivating motivation means. And if you have employees who are willing to put in the work and willing to work harder, 
it means that you can have decreased staff turnover. And turnover is expensive because if employees are leaving and you have to replace them, you're going to have to pay for that new person's training. You're going to have to pay for the process of rehiring the person. Like, it's not good. You also have increased productivity because if they're putting in more effort and they're working harder, they're going to be essentially wasting less time and wasting less resources. That means that they're more productive and efficient. And both of these things contribute to decreased costs, which in turn leads to increased profit. And profit is one of our main business objectives. Yeah, we have profit, market share, fulfilling a market or social need, and shareholder expectations. The other branch is well-trained and effective employees. If employees are good at their jobs, not only are they going to be more productive, they are also going to produce outputs that are of a higher quality, yeah? And if the outputs are of a higher quality, then they'll be able to satisfy customers more. And if that happens, we can really build up the business's reputation as a business that sells high quality goods that are worthwhile and valuable. And that can lead to increased sales because we've got more people coming to us. Increased sales can lead to increased market share, which is proportion of sales, which is, again, one of our big business objectives. And then increased sales revenue will help profit. So does that kind of make sense? This is not the only way to look at this stop point, but this is one way that I like to, to go through it, kind of links it to profit and market share. Now, motivation theories, we have Maslow here. Important to know, the thing is with the motivation theories, uh, there's been a question on them in every single exam, this study design. 2017, it was Locke and Latham. Um, 2018, you could choose between this Maslow or uh, Lawrence and Aria's four drive. And then in 20, in last year, excuse me, you could suggest any of them. So it's a pretty popular topic. For applying Maslow, there's not much you can do for physiological needs as a manager, unless like the only thing you can do is give employees enough money that they can afford their physiological needs. So things like food and shelter. Yeah. Now safety needs, those can be addressed by a manager in essentially two main ways. One is job security. And the other is a safe work environment by having good um, operational health and safety standards. Both of those can help contribute to safety needs. Social needs are things like a positive culture, rituals, as we remember, birthday parties and such, and collaborative tasks where people get actually communicating with each other. Esteem needs, think ego, right? Promotions, job titles, things that make you feel good and accomplished. And then self-actualization at the top is like the fluffy stuff. You know, opportunities for personal growth, challenging and creative work, that type of stuff. Now, for this next slide, I'm not going to go over it in detail explaining it. This is going to be more something for you to look at in your own time um, when it comes, when these get emailed to you. That, that'll be the case for a couple slides today. I'd rather you have the notes there, which is why they're in the slides, but we don't have enough time to go through them today. Here are our performance management strategies. This is the one that I do want to focus on a little bit more just because performance management hasn't been... One, two, three years, I was like, yeah, performance management will probably come up because it's new. Four years down the line and it still hasn't come up yet. So I'm just waiting. Now, the first one, management by objectives, is when a manager and employee will determine a set of goals. And then after a period of time, they'll come together and discuss how well that employee was able to achieve those goals. Yeah? Kind of similar to Luck and Latham. Appraisals, our next one. This is just, it's basically like the standard. If, I don't know if any of you have had like um, a, not a job interview, what's it called? A, like a performance appraisal, like a job appraisal, whatever it is, where like you sit down with your manager and they talk to you about your job performance that's what an appraisal is, right? It's like the most basic form of, of performance management. It's where the manager is looking at you and they are measuring your performance. 
self-evaluation. The important thing to understand here is it's not just when an employee assesses their own performance, because if an employee did that and then that was it, it finished, what's the point, right? What it, the second step is really important where the manager will also rate the employee and then the manager and employee will sit down and talk about those ratings. Yeah, they'll discuss what the, why there were differences between them. You know, does the employee think they're better or worse at something than what the manager thinks they are? All that sort of stuff. And that discussion leads to improvement in performance. And then lastly, employee observation. It's the collection of feedback relating to an employee's performance from other employees or managers or customers, whatever. And it's done through a whole bunch of different things, secret shoppers, phone conversation recordings, whatever. Now, the roles of participants in the workplace is actually another one where these are more for your benefit to read through um, in future rather than going through now. I do think that this will has the potential to appear in another exam question just because the only time it's ever come up was 2017. And it was a six marker in 2017, and it wasn't that well answered. The two participants that featured in that question were human resource managers and the Fair Work Commission. So employees, employer associations, and unions, none of those have been asked about yet. Okay, so we have dispute resolution here. I'm just like, some kids get taught conciliation. If you are one of those kids, forget about it. Conciliation is stupid and it's not on the study design. So you don't need to know it, just a heads up. Now, this one, grievance procedures, yet to appear on any exam, but mediation and arbitration featured in what has actually only been the only distinguished between question um, since 2017. So in terms of the steps of a grievance procedure, I'll show them all up here. Basically, it starts with an employee and their supervisor discussing an issue. Then it leads on to a meeting between the employee and their representative. So it might be someone from a union meeting with the senior manager, human resource manager, you know, basically getting the ball rolling on this whole dispute resolution thing. Step three is mediation and step four is arbitration, okay? Step three, they come together and they try to, they try to sort it out themselves, come to their own resolution. And if that fails, they move on to step four, arbitration, legally binding decision is made and that's it, that's the end of it, yeah? I was going to get you to do this question, but I'm not gonna do that to you, that's just too much, okay? Instead, what I want you to do is read this question and have a think about how we would answer it, okay? So distinguish between mediation and arbitration as a means of dispute resolution. This, like I mentioned before, the only distinguished between question that's come up on the exam in the recent study design. So we're using this as a basis for how to answer distinguish between questions because we know exactly what VCAR's expectations with this question were. Okay. That being said, distinguish between mediation and arbitration. Now we know several things about how to how to tackle a distinguished between question based on VCAR's exam report from 2017. First of all, it wasn't particularly well answered. Um, a third of the state got zero out of three, which isn't good. We don't like that. Basically, we know that you have to do two things in a distinguished between question. First of all, you need to show a clear understanding of both of the terms. And second of all, you need to state the differences between them. Now, I feel like, and I was taught the exact same thing. A lot of people are taught that distinguish between means, or you go, oh my God, well, both are dispute resolution, but the key difference between them is this. Like you identify a similarity and then you identify a difference. I don't know if anyone else is in the same boat with that, but that's what a lot of people tend to get taught with distinguish between. When in fact, you should only be focusing in on the differences. With low scoring responses for that particular question that year, um, it was questions, oh, sorry, it was answers that focused on similarities that were 
um, not vibed by VCAR that year or any questions that didn't highlight any differences. I feel like this is a cheat. You just kind of drop in both definitions and you, you leave it at that. That's not actually identifying differences. Also, when it comes to mediation, it's not about the mediator listening to the participants. It's about the mediator facilitating discussion between the participants, yeah? The mediator is the one who makes sure that they're on the right track, they're talking about the right things. They're not there to listen and give advice, they're just there to make sure that the participants are listening to each other. This was the sample response, just to illustrate what all of this means. First of all, we have the definitions of both. That's great, that's a mark. We show our understanding of these concepts. And then we have our first difference. In this case, it's who makes the final decision. So in mediation, it's talking about how um, both parties reach their own decision, whereas in arbitration, it is the independent third party who makes the decision, yeah? And then a second difference is here. This time, it's about whether or not they're legally binding. So mediation is not legally binding, whereas arbitration is. Now, Let's do OM and then we'll enter into a, into a break, yeah? So, with operations, there are several topics that haven't appeared on a current study design, um, study, study design exam yet. And we'll also be looking at quality, just because quality is the strategy that hasn't appeared since 2017 and was really poorly answered in 2017. For task words, for our, for our key skills section, you could be asked to discuss, evaluate any of these strategies today. So really, really important that you're looking at those. You need case studies, contemporary case studies, some good ones are your Colts, um, Coles, Woolies, they have pretty excellent operations case studies. You need to be able to compare tech, quality, materials and waste mint, okay? That's a lot of stuff to remember. Make sure you do that. Also evaluate, so the advantages and disadvantages. And it's the same thing for propose and justify. You have to propose and justify those various strategies. Okay, so when it comes to key elements and CSR, hopefully we all have an idea about what the key elements are. I'm just going to flick them up very quickly. We have inputs, processes, and outputs. And don't call this one um, transformation. Some people do. It's processes on the study design. Now, the important thing to understand with these is some people get um, inputs, processes and outputs confused when it comes to um, service businesses and manufacturing businesses. So a cafe manufacturing, it's kind of manufacturing and service, but they're making coffee in this instance. In this case, their inputs would be things like the baristas, the coffee machines, the milk, the coffee beans, time, the processes. Now, something to useful to know with processes is the ING rule. Basically, you are pour, you're making coffee or you're pouring milk. It's something that you're doing. It's a process. ING rule is very helpful with that. And then with outputs, it would be the coffee. Now that's relatively understandable, but sometimes we get a bit confused when it comes to service businesses. And that's really what happened in 2018, because there was a question about a service business. So if we're looking, let's say we're looking at a flight center store instead. Now a flight center store, the inputs would be the actual store itself, um, the employees, the computers that they use and the information in those computers, energy to power the building. The process that would really be taking place here, one of them would be delivering the holiday information, correct? The output in this case is the holiday information itself. And so what happened in 2018, oops, goodness me, is a lot of people said that processes and outputs in a service business are the same thing but they're not. They're similar, but they're not the same. In a, a process in a service business is delivering the holiday info, whereas the output is the holiday info itself. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now, CSR, what I think we might do 
um, at 2.30, regardless of where we're up to, we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll wrap up unit three in the next block because I don't want to talk longer than an hour. That's just too much. With CSR, all definitions, because they're two marks now, are going to have two elements. I think I mentioned that before. Now, for CSR, we know which two elements they're looking for because it came up on last year's exam. Kids were asked to define CSR. The first element of the definition is this one here. You have to highlight that CSR means going beyond the legal requirements. That's a quote from VCAR there. Yeah. The second element that you need is some indication of contexts in which such considerations may arise. So things like the environment, the economy, society, other stakeholders, whatever it happens to be. You just need to give, up, give some examples of those contexts. So this definition would be a two mark definition. Now with inputs, processes and outputs, this is again more something that I'll leave for you to look at if you need extra notes on this topic. I'm not going to break through all of these individually, except one of them which actually, no, I won't. There's a Kahoot question on this. So hopefully we, we do know these. Alrighty. Now, with our operation strategies, we have a lot of them. And so there is no way we're covering all of them today. Absolutely no way. Instead, what I'm doing is kind of focusing in on perhaps some of the ones we would forget. And then also focusing in on quality, because as I said, it hasn't come up since 2017. And quality is pretty complicated. Like those three strategies, um, there's, a, there's a potential for a pretty big question within those. Yeah. Before we do that, and we'll do that. How about we do this activity and then we, we finish and then we continue on with operations unit four in the next block. I think that works. So what I'll get you guys to do is evaluate the use. Re I want you to read that question and then read the answer provided. Okay. Evaluate the use of computer-aided design at a manufacturing business and it's five marks because evaluates are five marks. I want you to mark this answer out of five. Yeah? Have a look at each point and think, is this worth a mark? Can I give this answer a mark? Does that make sense? So you'll end up with like a three out of five or something like that. And then once you have an answer, I'll move forward and I'll tell you how an examiner would have marked this answer. Does that make sense? Boop. I'll give you a few minutes just to read over that, come up with a number in your head and then we'll go through the answer together. Once you come up with a number, I'll ask you guys to drop in the chat what you gave this response, yeah? If my chat decides to work, what the hell? Alrighty. Do we have a number in our heads for what we would mark this out of five? Yeah. 
I'm just, I'm, I'm going to stop this for a second. Awesome. Oh, thank you guys. I'm going to share screen again in a second, but my thing's being stupid. So I'm just going to read it for a sec. We've got a whole lot of fours. We've got a couple threes. Okay. That's interesting. So if we, if an examiner was looking at this response and marking it, the examiner, excuse me, setting up my zoom would probably give it around a two. Okay. So you're actually not that far off. Um, I did one of these in my earlier lecture and it was a zero out of five and everyone was telling me it was a three. I was like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> so the thing is with these activities, I do them with my kids a lot. Uh, it's always lower than what you think. Now, with this, the reason it's a two instead of um, a three or a four, which is the common answers, let's break it down. First of all, it's good that they defined right off the bat. I really think it's important that in an evaluate, oh, shut up phone. Sorry, I set, I set a timer for this activity and I forgot about it. I really um, suggest that you define the thing you're evaluating because it was actually a, important in last year. Um, there was an evaluate question last year and you had to define it or show that you understood it. So really, really important to do it. But let's break this down one by one. One advantage of CAD is that it increases design accuracy. But why is that good? Yeah, why is that actually considered an advantage? Yeah, we have to be really careful. This case, it could be that ooh, we're expending less physical resources to, exp um, to perfect the design and therefore we're generating less waste. Um, or potentially we could say that because the design accuracy itself is much greater, it's going to end up producing much less errors. Yeah, the product itself will be higher quality, you could say. Either one is fine, but you need to actually explain why something is an advantage. This one here does that, okay? Because it links it to things like productivity and time efficiency, which is what you're supposed to do, um, which means it can be produced sooner and therefore that's good. That's what we want. The next one, a disadvantage is that CAD has high setup costs and therefore limited short-term profit. This one's good, okay? This one's good because it actually links it to profit, which is a really good way to explain why something is good or bad. It's it's bad because it can help you, it helps you lose profit, right? That's a really good way to explain it. Another is that employees must be trained in how to use CAD since it is a software. Well, not really explained, is it? Why is that a disadvantage? We would link that to costs, yeah? Because training costs money. So not good because it increased our costs. And then lastly, I'm sure this like would have um, gotten a few of you. Ultimately, th this conclusion, this final opinion, way too short, way too short. Last year for the evaluate, Vika really like, they usually, they, they used to not care, but now they actually want your final opinions to be quite long and well justified. Like that just wouldn't do the trick. You need to be a bit more detailed. But that's overall why it's two marks. Can we see why? Now, what we're going to do is whoop, we're going to jump ahead to the break. We didn't really have much stuff to do anyways, because I've been talking for an hour and you guys deserve to stop hearing me. So we'll come back to those last few things after 10 minutes. But for now, go ahead. Don't leave the Zoom, but just turn off your, your video and chill out for a bit. That's fine. So we'll be back at about 2.40, yeah? Yo, sorry, I'll answer your questions. Just realized I missed those when they came through. So with um, the definition doesn't matter in an evaluate, it's one of those things where like, it's not worth a mark, but you have to do it. It's stupid. Like, I don't, <laughs> like they'll, they would take off a mark if you didn't do it, but it's not in itself worth a mark. That's just how it worked last year. Um, and in our final opinion, do we add 
in another advantage or disadvantage no but we kind of like summarize it be like overall because the the business is mainly interested in improving profit i don't think that they should invest in cad because cad has such high initial setup costs and even though there are some benefits down the line if they want to improve profit in the short term they probably shouldn't buy it does that make sense so it's just a little bit more of an explanation for why you wouldn't for why you feel a particular way yes or no okay i'll actually shut up now <laughs> i've got a timer going so we have like eight or so minutes and then we'll come back Okay, that was about 10 minutes. So what we're going to do is hop back onto where we were up to with operations. Luckily, there isn't too much to go back over. So allow me to dip back into a bit of materials and a bit of quality. So with materials, honestly, like, wait, you guys know how to do like the reaction things, right, on Zoom where it's like thumb or like wave. I'm curious, how many people remembered materials requirement planning and master production schedule? Because <laughs> yo, when I was in year 12, that stuff just disappeared straight up. Um, with these two, I think they're important to know just because they are very small, <laughs> very small little topics. And I think it would be a very easy thing for VCAR to slip in like a little describe or a little distinguish between just because it's one of the, the who the hell studies these topics, you know? Um, and in terms of the main kind of difference between them, what, well, the main difference is that we're, master production schedule is everything, right? It covers how much you're going to produce. It covers what you're going to produce. It covers when you need to produce everything by. It covers how you're going to produce everything, like what technology you're going to use, what labor you're going to use. Whereas materials requirement planning is smaller and it actually supports the master production schedule. It's just like the physical resources, whereas MPS is everything. So that's kind of the key difference. Um, another difference might be that materials requirement planning covers supplier, supplier lead-in times, so like delivery times, whereas master production schedule kind of doesn't. Links to effectiveness and efficiency for all of these strategies, not just these two, but for all of the tech, for all of materials and quality and the principles of lean management are really important because this is how VCAR asks questions related to these strategies. They'll say, how can X strategy improve a business's, um, improve the efficiency of a business's operations? Yeah. So make sure you really understand all those links. In this case, you know, they both help to ensure enough product is produced that customer expectations are met, but they also try to tighten inventory and reduce waste associated with extra inventory. Like we try to be as specific as possible. So we never have too much, but we also don't have too little. Now, principles of lean management. Let's have a little chat because the thing, we're not going to go through it in detail just because everyone here would have learnt completely different um, uh, principles of lean management. There's like 12, nine, like different ones that examiners are told are correct. And that's not even all of them. Like there are so many different principles. When I was at school, I learnt automation, Kaizen and just in time. But other ones that VCAS said were acceptable last year, they said pull through production or pull or whatever you want to call it. Uh, zero defects, 5S. I don't know what 5S is. I just saw it in the exam report and it's there. Um, Tim Wood and I think they said Kaizen is another one. But yeah, so there's so many different ones to know and that's totally fine. The one thing that you do need to really focus on though is I suggest picking three that you're absolutely confident in and memorizing that you can link those three or making sure, sorry, that you can link those three to effectiveness and efficiency. Lean management is not a well-answered topic. It's been in 2017 and 2019, and both years, those questions were not handled very well. So I recommend studying this because, again, VCA like to 
replay questions that were answered badly the previous year. And this was certainly one of those topics. Quality, real quick, assurance and control. Assur sorry, control is the checking of products and services over production to ensure they meet. Now, I listen here, predetermined standards of quality predetermined standards of quality. The thing is, when a lot of people define quality control, they'll say it's when you check products and services to make sure they're of a high quality. And that's wrong, that's wrong, okay? It's not about a high quality, it's about meeting predetermined standards of quality. So we have these uh, steps in quality control. Let's use your cult as an example. So your cult has very, it's like a food thing. So food has, the food industry has very strong um, quality standards because people can get sick and die and they can get sued. So Yakult, for example, one of their standards of quality is that every bottle of Yakult, I believe, has to have, I think it's 2 billion of those probiotic bacteria in it, okay? Every bottle has to have that. That's their quality standard. And so as production goes on, blah, 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 every now and then they're going to test some bottles of Yakult. And if those bottles are less than the 200, or sorry, the 2 billion bacteria, then it doesn't meet those established quality standards. Yeah, they compare it to the quality standards. And if it doesn't meet those, they'll take step four, corrective action. Corrective action for your cult would just be to throw it out. Like you can't really do anything once it's already been made. But other companies, um, if it was a car or something, they might just fix it. Yeah. It's not about high quality. It's about meeting pre-established standards of quality. Quality assurance, on the other hand, this is um, our proactive to the quality controls reactive. Quality assurance is a certification given to a business by an independent third party. So the business is going to invite someone in and that person's going to have a clipboard or whatever and they're going to go around and they're going to make sure that everything's good, everything's up to standard. And if it is, they can give them the quality assurance. So it's literally like a certification that tells me that your processes are up to the standards of that particular certification. And there's so many different quality assurances out there, um, heaps. It's proactive. Do we know what proactive and reactive means? It kind of, it's important with regards to change as well. Proactive means you're taking steps in advance. And so quality assurance, you're taking steps in advance to um, improve your processes. Whereas quality control, the mistakes already happened. You know, you've already made the dodgy bottle of your cult. It's the mistakes there in front of you. So all you're doing is reacting to a mistake that you already made. TQM. Now, I don't really, don't, you don't have to absorb this entire definition. The main thing I want you to look at is this word here um, because it's really useful holistic. I really would encourage you to use this in your definition of TQM because it really encompasses what TQM is. It is everyone in the business at all points dedicating themselves to improving quality of processes at the business. Does that make sense? It's like, TQM is like almost like a mindset. Like it's this idea that everyone is trying to get continuous improvement in the processes of the business. And it operates on three key principles. The first one is, in fact, continuous improvement. Now, this one's kind of, I think, self-explanatory in the name, continuous improvement. It's when you want to continuously improve. It's this idea that there are always avenues to make your processes better. There's no status quo. You're going to be constantly trying to use innovation to come up with new ways to improve quality in production. Always, always, always thinking about ways we can improve. Never settling for what is. Customer focus. Now, with this stuff, I, I actually want you to answer this question for me. Um, do, do we know what internal, external customers mean? Just like, give me a thumbs up if we do, because if we don't, then I'll happy to explain it, but I don't want to waste time. Do we know what internal, external customers means?
we're not too good with that one. That's understandable. With, um, I've seen a couple thumbs up, so that's good, but I'll explain it um, to everyone anyways. Internal customers are like, like say I'm in a production line, I work at Amazon uh, and I do my thing in the production line. I, I don't know, it's like a, a packet of clothes and I'm wrapping it up, okay? That's my job on the production line. When I hand it to someone else in the production line and they do their job, you know, maybe they add a sticker. The whole point of internal customers is they are my internal customer. They work with me, like they're my coworker, but my job, I hand off to them and then they do their job. And so customer focus is this idea that if you do your job well, then that's good. And you hand it off to the next customer, internal customer, who also does their job well and so on and so forth. And every single person in line, if they all put in the, the effort, then the final product will be a culmination of all everyone's like full effort when they're doing their job. Does that make sense? And that's why it's like important. It's like quality. Every single person has to do their job when it comes to quality. And then external customers are just the people you sell to. So they're just the, the, you know, me when I go and buy a phone type of thing. And lastly, worker participation. It's this again, sorry, excuse me. I'm, I'm at a really uncomfortable table. Really important mindset. Employees know what they're doing. They are experts in their field. And so we should ask them for advice. We should ask them for their ideas. We should get them to come up with new innovations. So we're trying to get them involved. Okay, global considerations. Hot take, I hate this topic. Um, but super important topic because 2017 hadn't, didn't appear. 2018 didn't appear. 2019 didn't appear. 2020, if it doesn't appear, I'm going to die because every year I've been saying, yo, they're going to drop um, global considerations. It's a really thing, easy thing to ask about. I bet they're going to ask or discuss like, and they just never have. It's killing me. If it doesn't happen this year, it just is never going to happen. The thing is with these ones, so easy to get mixed up. So easy to get mixed up. Let's go one by one. Global sourcing of inputs is when a business imports the resources. Now, down below, I have what are here some advantages and disadvantages. These ones I'm not really going to talk about. This is, again, more something for you to look back on. I'm more concerned today with just explaining what they are and making sure we don't get them mixed up. So the first one, global sourcing of inputs is when we buy our inputs from an overseas company and we import them into Australia. Yeah. Just always look at inputs. That means we're buying things from, we're buying our inputs from overseas. Yeah. Now when it gets to overseas manufacturing, however, this is when the entire production process happens overseas. So businesses like Toyota do this, like you no one makes cars in Australia because we're crap at it. Um, so instead, Toyota Australia, like all the cars are going to be made in Japan, but then we're going to sell them here. Yeah. So the production process happens overseas and then we bring them in and we sell them in Australia. The reason we do this, I'll just like briefly touch on one of the main advantages, um, comparative advantages. Sometimes countries are just better at doing something than others. You know, we have our strengths. We're really good at coal I don't know we're really good at education that's something we're good at but uh, we're crap at making cars right whereas Japan is really excellent at making cars so it makes sense that we would have our car production happen in Japan because they're more efficient efficient they're more effective it's going to save us money now global outsourcing okay this is where things get messy it's where everyone trips up global outsourcing non-production related business functions. And I'm about to list them for you. Are you ready? One, IT. Two, telecommunications. Three, accounting. And four, marketing, right? Th those are not like the only ones that exist, but I use those to really illustrate what global outsourcing is. Production is inputs, processes, outputs, making things, whatever non-production related business functions are things like IT, telecommunications, marketing and accounting. It's not actually 
part of making things really important that we i feel like everyone gets global outsourcing gets mixed up with global sourcing of inputs um, these two can get mixed up pretty easy it's just a bit of a mess let's not mix these ones up and then supply chain management at the end there the control and coordination of a business's supply chain believe it or not with the aim of maximizing oh sorry the main the aim, excuse me, of meeting customer demands for goods and services while being efficient and effective with your inputs. Supply chain management, it's kind of funny because it's become really relevant, really vulnerable to global risk. Um, if we talk about coals briefly, the reason coals for a while there had like no food on the shelves is because coals have a very global supply chain. They buy stuff from overseas, heaps of stuff. And then when COVID happened and there were no planes running, there was no inputs coming in from overseas. So Coles didn't have anything to put on the shelf. I didn't help that Coles uses just in time. So they barely have like a week's worth of stuff in storage. So they, if, if things go, um, they really don't have a lot to replace the shelves with, which is why we ended up in the situation we ended up with earlier. This is not break. Now we're going to go into unit four. After this, we'll do a Kahoot and then we will um, do a little bit of an intro into a case study. So all of these topics for unit four, area study one, the need for change, have appeared on an exam. In fact, KPIs have appeared nine times um, on the past exams. Very popular topic, our KPIs. Business change was last year, it was a four marker. Force field analysis, um, has come up once, it was 2018, it was a five marker, it was actually pretty well answered. Driving and restraining forces um, came up in 2017, it was the very last question of the exam. And then lower cost and differentiation was 2017 and 2019. 2017 it wasn't answered very well, 2019 there was improvement, so hopefully won't see it again in 2020. Broadly business change, this isn't really something I want to focus on to be honest. There's just a broad understanding that we need that it can be planned or it can be unplanned or reactive, proactive or reactive. The thing with change is that it's often challenging, confronting and confusing, which is why we need things like leadership and change. It's why we need things like um, unfreeze, uh, unfreeze, refreeze movement. We need all these things to help us cope with change because change can be challenging, confronting and confusing. However, it's also ongoing and inevitable. We have to change or we will fall apart, yeah? Businesses who refuse to change are always the ones who disappear within a few years, okay? You need to be constantly changing to adapt to your surroundings. Now, KPIs, we've said it before, two, def two elements of every definition. In this case, for KPIs, because this was a 2018 define, First element was you had to call it something like a criterion or a set of data or a measure or a set of measures or a set of criteria, anything like that was fine. You just couldn't call it an indicator, right? You can't say key performance indicators are indicators that doesn't fly with VCAR. That can be used to assess performance of business objectives over time. The second element there is business objectives. You need to highlight that they're used to assess performance with regards to business objectives somewhere in your definition. We have nine KPIs, right? So what we're gonna do now is, so just for you guys, cause we'll, what we'll do is each of these definitions, one of them has a mistake, okay? Two of them are correct and one of them has a mistake. So what I'm gonna get you guys to do is if you go, so if you go onto the top of the screen and it says like viewing Jasmine's screen or whatever in bright green, next to it, there's an option and it says viewing options, okay? If you click on that, it'll it one of the options on the side that pops up should be annotate, yeah? So, oh, just lost headphones for a minute. Are my headphones okay? <laughs> That would suck if they're not working. If things aren't working, do let me know. 
But does everyone understand what I'm saying with these directions in terms of annotates? So you should be allowed to annotate now. I've given you all permission. So if you go into viewing options and then click annotate, what I want you to do is do, I'll actually I'll demonstrate. So you have an option, you can click a stamp or just circle it, I don't care. And I want you to stamp which of these three, whoop, I think, Sarah, um, you're trying to control my screen, which is, <laughs> I'm not going to let you do that. Just, I think you followed the wrong directions there. But that's how I want you to do it, yeah? Stamp whichever one you think is the incorrect answer. Don't stamp all over the screen. <laughs> Yo, Let's try to limit it to one stamp per person. Make it easier for me. And I will clear my own annotations. How are we going? Okay, well, I'm very happy with the way this has gone so far um, because most of you guys seem to have picked A and that's correct. Yes, Co A is good. Does anyone know you can type it in the chat or you can say it out loud. Does anyone know why A is incorrect? Does anyone know what the mistake is with A? Because turnover is when they replace the person. Yes, absolutely. So allow me to, sorry, my thing's being stupid. Okay, should work now. Yes, that is true. <laughs> Y'all <laughs> with the stamps, chill out. Correct. Now, we know this from last year where we had a question that actually said define level of staff turnover. So we know exactly what's expected of this particular topic. Now, sorry, just give me one second. Okay. Does that make sense for everyone? Now, um, this is stupid. Okay, the problem, we need two things. One of those things is you need to specify that they get replaced. So if we were to fix it, that's all we'd have to do. But it's good that everyone picked up on that one quickly. Try this one now, okay? I will allow, in a defined question like that, because it's in section B, do we need to link it to the case study? That's actually, like, I don't, you didn't have to, which I thought was stupid, because I it like breaks precedent. I think that you should, just in case Vicar ever flip-flop and decide, yes, you need to link it to the case study because they're stupid. So I'm going to allow um, annotations again. I turned it off for a second, but I will. Okay, there you go. Stamp the one that you think is incorrect. And let me know if the stamps are working. Okay, good. I'm seeing some things pop up. We like to see it. We are very enthusiastic about option B. Oop. Sorry, I won't drink <laughs> when I've got a microphone next to my mouth. That's a bit grot. I'll wait until later. Well, good job, everyone, once again. Let me turn off annotations because y'all y'all going a little crazy. Um, yes, correct with that one. Um, the ah, da, 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 stop being stupid. Okay, there we go. Correct with that one. We would go B is incorrect. And I would assume most of you would know the reason considering you all went for it pretty fast. You don't use the name of the thing in the definition of the thing. And that applies for even things like differentiation. You wouldn't use different, different in your definition of differentiation. This case, rate of productivity growth refers to the rate at which output is a no. You would that's a mistake there. We would fix it with something like refers to the increase or decrease of output. Yeah. Now, last one. Let me wipe all your lovely annotations. Okay. Same time. Pick which one you think is incorrect of these three.
I'm glad you're all letting your artistic abilities flare. So, seem pretty enthused by option B. Can anyone tell me why option B is incorrect? Why is option B the wrong option here? What exactly is the mistake that's occurring? I would assume due to your significant enthusiasm that we would have an idea needs to say express. Yes. So when we're defining, this is something that like I, I'm pointing out because I see it all the time in like kids sacks and practice exams and stuff. It's not just the number of people who are dissatisfied. If the thing is like, if you go into a business, if you go into a restaurant and like I, I, I'm in there, I order the carbonara and I eat it and it's crap. I'm, if I don't tell the business that it's crap, then they're not going to know. I'm just going to walk out the door feeling really sad that I spent money on a bad carbonara, right? You need to actually tell the business for them to record it down as a KPI. So anything that's similar to the word notified, alerted, expressed, as um, I forget who your name was, as Jade said, that's fine. But you do need to identify that. I'm really glad that a lot of you did catch up on those pretty quickly. Force field analysis theory, fun stuff. So force field analysis, we have a proposed change and we have forces that act on either side of that proposed change. They are driving or they are restraining. Driving forces are any that are trying to cause or support the change. Working against that are our restraining forces, which are those that act to block the change from occurring. And I'm sure all of us are relatively familiar with this. I'm question, question, question. Give me a thumbs up if you agree with this statement. When driving forces and restraining forces are equal, the change is likely to occur. When they are equal, the change is likely to occur. Does anyone agree with that statement? How are we feeling? I'm going to take that as a no, and that's good. That's what I wanted, okay? Because, no, <laughs> thank you. No, because on, the only situation, according to Lewin, where the proposed change can succeed is if driving forces are stronger than restraining, right? So that's the only situation in which the driving forces can actually overpower. Now, we have a whole bunch of driving and restraining forces listed on the study design. And I'll take this opportunity to just ask you now, we have no specific slides on these, but if you want me to explain any one of these, I can do that. You just need to tell me. You can say it or just type it in the chat or something. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but just real quick, does anyone want me to talk about any of these driving or restraining forces? Organizational inertia is always that one that people want. As legislation, employees, and organizational inertia. Cool, I'll do those three. Organizational inertia, first up, is basically when you are so ingrained into your routines. You are just so deeply ingrained into your routines that you cannot break out of them. You cannot summon the desire to change. That's kind of what it means. It's this, just this idea that, no, we've been doing this We've been doing it like this for years and we're not going to change now. If anyone has ever watched Kitchen Nightmares, like Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares, where he goes out to the, um, to the businesses and he's like, he tries the food and he's like, this is trash. And they're like, well, I'm not going to change it just because you told me it's trash. That's what organizational inertia is. Just refusal to just accept the need for change, essentially. What was the other one? Legislation. So legislation depends, it depends on the legisl legislation itself if it's driving or restraining. If the government says, hi, we're going to introduce caps on how much carbon emissions that you can emit as a business. Well, that's going to be a very strong driving force for me to change because if there's a carbon cap and I'm going to get fined if I go over that cap, I don't want to get fined. So I'm going to implement changes to help reduce my carbon emissions. And then on the other hand, it could be restraining because legislation, if I want to do something, say I want to pay my workers $5 an hour. 
Well, a pretty strong restraining force on that would be legislation because that's illegal. <laughs> I kind of can't pay people $5 an hour. So I'd have to give up on that proposed change pretty quickly. So it just depends on the nature of the legislation itself on whether it's driving or restraining. For employees, um, I think you mentioned that employees are restraining, Jessica. That's actually not necessarily true. On the study design, employees can either be driving forces or they can be restraining forces. And again, it depends on the situation. I, mean, I think often they're restraining forces. It just depends on the change. Like if I walk up to all my employees and I say, hi, everyone, we're firing 50% of you, then I think they would be pretty pretty restraining on that particular change. But if it was something like, hi, everyone, we think we should change our policy to better adapt to customer needs. Well, I think a lot of employees would be supportive of that. Yeah. And so they might be considered a driving force. So it just depends on the situation. Here are the steps of a force field analysis that have been taken from the 2018 exam report, because that was when we had a question on it. Um, propose a change, identify driving forces acting upon it, give scores. That's the one thing I really just want to focus on. You give scores and you weigh them. And then you develop strategies to help minimize restraining or maximize driving forces. This is why that fourth step is why this is a useful theory, because it gives us the chance to look at what's happening in our business, look at what's pushing us for change, look at what's holding us back and think, okay, if we really want this change, what can we do to help minimize those restraining forces and maximize those ma um, driving forces so that we can make the change successful? Does that make sense? So that, that fourth step is why this is a useful theory in practice. Also, it's not counting the number of strategies. It's weighing them based on strength. If you were to give them scores out of five based on strength, for example, well, maybe employees as a driving force are a two. They're kind of strong. But legislation as a restraining force, that might be five out of five for strength because it's the law. What are you going to do? Quick thing on differentiation and lower cost. Um, with lower cost, this is when a business produces its goods at the cheapest cost relative to other competitors. So businesses like Aldi and Zara are really focused on doing this. Zara is crazy cheap um, in terms of how they produce, not necessarily what they sell at. And that kind of links me into this next point. Lower cost is not selling products at a lower than average cost. That is not what it is. Lower cost is producing at a lower than average cost. Okay. Some of the textbook get this, get this a bit mixed up. Um, Ed Rollo, Ed Rollo, I'm putting shade on Ed Rollo here. It is just, I really can't, can't emphasize that enough. Lower cost is all about becoming the cheapest producer in the industry. Okay. Once you become the cheapest producer in the industry, then you can choose to sell at a lower than average cost. But that in itself is not what lower cost is as a definition. What can we do to become lower costs? We can outsource. We can hire people from cheaper countries to do our jobs. We can buy raw materials that are cheap. We can implement just in time to reduce waste. Heaps of things we can do. Differentiation. I feel like most of us are pretty confident with differentiation because it's a little bit simpler. A key word to use when you're defining it is uniqueness because it's a good replacement for the word differentiation. Now, in terms of how they're implemented, look, there's so many different I love learning about businesses who differentiate. I think it's so interesting. Like um, my, one of my favorite stories is like Nokia versus Apple. I love Nokia versus Apple. If you ever get a chance to read it, like Nokia was back, uh, sorry, not Nokia, Blackberry, Blackberry. Does anyone remember Blackberry? I feel like all our parents had them as work phones. Um, they were very, they had the, the, they would have a screen like that big. You can't see my phone that's not working. They would have a screen like that big and then they would have just like the keyboard at the bottom and they got smashed when Apple in 2007 innovated and created the touchscreen phone. Okay. That was differentiation. That was some kind of innovation 
We'd never seen it before and it made Apple products, it made iPhones unique. And so everyone, if they wanted to get an iPhone, they had to buy it from Apple. And that's why they became successful. And Apple have been doing that for so, so long, you know, so long. And they've become, they've almost got the, um, the branding done as well. Like I'm never going to, I'd rather die than buy an Android, like straight up. I just, I look at my brother's Android and I feel sick to my stomach. Um, I am basic, but I just can't step away from the smoothness of an Apple phone. I'll just never be able to do it. And that's kind of, like, I feel a bit Stockholm syndrome victim type of thing, but that's just how it is. Now, in terms of other businesses who, an, another business, excuse me, who uses differentiation well, Nike. And I mean that in the sense that like Nike Air Forces um, or Air Jordans is what I'm supposed to say. Air Jordans, they're relatively normal shoes, but people love them and want to buy them and want to wear them because of the unique celebrity endorsement of that particular product, right? And so people really are driven to buy um, Air Jordans just because of that differentiated aspect of it. Now with Porters, as I said, it's becoming, we're mainly just focused on lower cost here. It's becoming the lowest cost producer in the industry. Once you are that, you have two options. First option, we sell our products at a cheaper than average price, right? That's the one most people know makes sense because if we do that, if we sell products at a cheaper than average price, we can appeal to price conscious consumers like myself who will only ever buy things that are cheap. I, when I will go into Coles and I'm picking what block of chocolate to get, I'm going to base it on which one's on sale the most. I'm not going to really look at brands. If Lint is cheaper than Cadbury, then that's where I'm going. The only exception to that is home brand chocolate because home brand chocolate is filth. It's filth. Terrible. But oh, and the other side of it, though, is instead of if we're this is us, sorry, my hands are being stupid because of the background, but let's say this is our revenue and this is our costs, okay? And everything in between is profit because profit is revenue minus costs. Now, if I choose to, I become a low cost producer and I reduce my costs, okay? I can also, for that first option, I'm gonna be reducing revenue because I'm selling at a cheaper price than competitors. So I'll have smaller profit, but I have that competitive advantage of appealing to price conscious consumers. However, on the other side, basically what this means is we drop our costs and notice that profit is just increased, okay? Purely just by dropping costs and selling at an average price. We now have more profit than our competitors because we have the lowest cost of our competitors. And that means that we can grow faster than they can, okay? We have more money to spend. We can buy more things. We can buy all the machinery we want. We can buy a whole bunch of new factories. We can do whatever we want because we have more money than they do. And that is a competitive advantage. And then differentiation, customers can only come to you. It kind of just has that one competitive advantage. And all of these contribute to a competitive edge, competitiveness and market share. Now, let's do this one pretty quickly, okay? I don't want to drag this on too, too much longer. Um, we'll do this and then the Kahoot and then that's it. So, Unit 4, Area Study 2, Implementing Change. Leadership in change management. There are many different roles that a leader can take up during change. We'll talk a little bit about a few of them. Um, now, this has only been a question in 2018. It was a six marker, contemporary Case study question, spicy. The sample answer used Telstra, if you ever wanted to read over that sample answer. Now, the first real major role of a leader during change is to build momentum toward change by establishing the need for it, okay? It is a leader saying, hi, everyone, we need to do this because of, look at all the opportunities it will give us, yeah? We're going to gain extra market share. We're going to gain profit. We're going to go really well. That's establishing the need for change and really trying to build support for it, yeah? Reducing resistance to change, that second role, change is very tough. It is. It's tough for a lot of people. And so it's important that a leader is very clear and honest in their communication. 
very much trying to reduce all of those unknowns associated with change because that's we're often scared of change because we don't know what's going on yeah we're scared of the unknown but a leader who can communicate and be really clear about what the change is going to look like will be able to reduce resistance to change and then lastly direct the business and its stakeholders towards the same goals it's all about being like yo we're a team everyone together you be empathetic towards your um, employees you offer them support you offer them training basically trying to get everyone on board and feeling like they're part of a team that can ex that can achieve successful change basically What's the problem with this statement? I want you all to read it. And if anyone has an answer, chuck it in the chat. A leader is important during change, change management, excuse me, as it is the leader's responsibility to make the correct decisions regarding um, which changes to implement. A leader is a decision maker and needs to implement strategies that will help the business improve performance. Reading that statement, is there anything a bit sus about it? Anything that we don't quite vibe in the context of leadership in change management? Because I'm telling you now that if you were to write that in an exam about leadership in change management, that would be worth nothing. Bit unsure? That's okay. Let's look at the dot point. It says importance of leadership in change management. Yeah. You have to focus on management, not the change itself. And what I mean by that, like change management is everything we just spoke about. It's we're already committed to a change and we're going to try and support you through it. We're reducing resistance. We're establishing the need, all that sort of stuff. The change itself is things like using decision making power to figure out the best strategy like that's not actually part of change management yeah that's just creating the change itself not relevant to this dot point okay there are eight management strategies to respond to kpis on the study design this is our next kind of area staff training motivation change of styles change of skills investment in tech improving quality cost cutting initiating lean production techniques and redeployment of resources that's a lot, okay. Um, I'm just gonna check something very quickly, guys. So I'm gonna briefly close this one. Excellent, so that's right, I know what we're gonna do. What I want you to do is, we have a little case study here. We'll do this twice. I want you to suggest two of these strategies that would best suit this situation and i'm letting you know now that there are way more correct answers than two pretty much every or pretty much all eight of these you could somehow fit into this situation but i'm asking for maybe the most appropriate ones the most suitable options yeah have a read and then drop into your chat your idea and i, I like i swear to god every single answer you give me is going to be correct it's just that some are easier to justify than others Our first one, our first two, staff training and improving quality in production. Nice. Does anyone else have something? Staff training and staff motivation. Yep. Absolutely. Staff training, improving production. Yep. Yep. Improving quality. Training, redeployment of resources. Yep. I'm liking this because it's, yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, you guys are pretty much on track with what I was thinking as well, like in terms of the ones that you would go for quickly, like staff training probably the easiest to justify. I mean, you train them so that they make less mistakes. They stuff up less of the, of the pastries because if there's less mistakes, then there'll be less complaints. Nice, quick, easy. Improving quality in production, absolutely too. So we check at various stages of production to ensure that any product that doesn't meet our standards is identified. We don't put out any pastries that look bad and don't meet our standards, okay? That will prevent bad pastries 
that oh, sorry pastries who don't meet our standards from being sold to people so that's good right achieves our goal and redeployment of resources works too maybe you redeploy labor to maybe you redeploy someone who usually works in the bakery part into the front desk and they they carry the register instead right maybe that's a job that they're better at so that's totally true as well and staff motivation hey maybe they're making mistakes because they're very they're lacking in motivation and they're not putting in the effort then in which case motivation would totally work quick second round this one here have a go and tell me which two you think would best suit this situation again lots of correct options so i will take pretty much anything We got lean, initiating lean production techniques and staff motivation, nice. That one makes sense, yeah. It's actually changing management styles and staff motivation, yep. Staff motivation and improving OHS. Just to grab onto that one real quickly, Hamza, um, improving OHS isn't one of the strategies. Like I, I kind of, I get what you mean, but it's just doesn't, it's not one of the strategies that we have the option to suggest. Yeah, you guys are all pretty much on the same track that I was too. So the one thing that I said that you guys didn't is increased investment in technology. If we buy technology that's energy efficient and helps to reduce wastage, um, because that would directly address the reasons behind the customer's complaints. And all of you who said initiating lean production techniques, correct, absolutely correct there too. Also, change in management styles. Yo, let's go consultative. These people feel like, you know, they don't feel like they're being hurt. Yeah, they know how to fix the problem, but are never asked. So let's introduce participative or consultative management and get that two-way communication going, yeah? Real quick, let's do unfreeze, change, and refreeze. Unfreeze, we'll probably go over this in more detail when we do the... um the case study but it's all the preparation we do in anticipation of the change and its main purpose is to establish the need for it okay the change itself the change itself and this second step you can call it movement you can call it change as far as i'm aware it really doesn't matter i like vika kind of call it both so it's fine whether you call it movement or change this is transitioning from old to new practices and this is where we have the most resistance to change so we need to deal with that we need to help reduce resistance to change during that movement step and then once we get to where we want to go we want to make sure that that change lasts into the business's long-term future that's the main point of this whole model we want the change to actually last okay so it's all about we're in our current position we're in point a and we want to get to point b so we unfreeze at point a okay we shake it off we get ready to move second step we move from point a to point b okay we're at point b now we, we don't want to go back to point A. We don't want to go backwards. We want to stay where we are. So we refreeze in our new position. Does that make sense? If you had a question like this, yeah? So apply Lewin's three-step change model to this particular business. The marking allocation would look like this, where you would have one mark for just explaining the step and then a second mark for applying the step. Okay, so if you're ever asked to apply it, make sure you, t you tell me what the steps are first. You define the step and then you apply it to the business because that is worth a mark, that definition, okay? Really quick, CSR when implementing change, we can do it in two ways. The first of which a business can express um, social responsibility by reducing ne negative outcomes of its own activities. Um, they can introduce biodegradable packaging. They can change to more energy efficient technology. They could also do something like changing from overseas manufacturing to local production. So bringing stuff from overseas into Australia to help support Australian jobs. And also buying inputs from local suppliers instead of overseas. That's another CSR consideration. 
notice that all of these I'm actually specifying that it's changing. Okay. You're changing. You need to be really careful because this is CSR when implementing change. So be, make sure you have the word change somewhere in your suggestion. And then also stakeholders treated ethically throughout change. So things like access to training so that they can reduce stress, communication to reduce anxiety, work-life balance throughout periods of change, being honest, not, dece not being um, deceptive towards your employees, and also allowing for transition services if employees need to be made redundant. Okay, so... You know what, let's do the Kahoot now. While we're fresh, we'll do the Kahoot, then we'll have a quick break and then we'll do our case study. So just so you guys know, um, I'm gonna have to like log into my case study and do various things here for a second. Not log into my case study, log into my Kahoot. Um, I have, cause I teach a weekly Bizman class. Um, so I have literally, I think I have like 60 Kahoots for Bizman. It's kind of like I, oh, 50. I've got 50 cahoots for Bizman. So my username is that. Oh, shit. Oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry. My username is Jazz April. And so if you want, you can use all of the cahoots that I've ever made um, for revision, just so you know. But let's play this one. Does everyone here know how to play cahoots? Are we all familiar? I would assume so. Everyone here was born in the 2000s. We all know what Kahoot is. I instinctively went to join it myself. Bruh. <laughs> on this but use use thinking <laughs> Alrighty, good job. Biodegradable packaging. When you sell something, it you sell it in packaging. So it's part of the output. Yeah, it's part of the output that you sell to customers. So it would be, I'm, I'm sad no one picked green, honestly. I thought it was hilarious for that response. But it's part of the output you sell. with that I quizzed you on that in the thing I should have waited I should have just let this be a surprise question when driving forces and restraining forces are equal status quo stays the same nothing happens nothing nothing changes but we wouldn't say it's impossible to succeed that's not the case it's just that right now we can't but if we put in the right strategies then yes we can definitely help increase the likelihood of change congratulations nugget Good job. This is actually pretty good. Sometimes I run these things in like big lectures um, and I'm a little bit shocked at the results, but this has been pretty consistent. Our three principles are worker participation, customer focus and continuous improvement. So that leaves out employee innovation. Good, happy 
with that, yeah? Business can unfreeze itself false, but it would be true if the question said refreeze. That's how we would refreeze ourselves. We would celebrate successful change. Oh, sorry, I skipped. I, you didn't get to see who the leader was. I'm sorry. Now, I, I figured uh, consultative would get some people. Consultative management, the manager will consult employees, will get their opinion, but the manager still makes the final decision, which is centralised decision-making, not decentralised. Alrighty, racing through. <laughs> awards and they sign off on agreements they don't make them but they do sign off on them and they can also um, they're often the mediator or the arbitrator in a dispute HR managers won't create awards awards are there's like 144 of them or something in Australia every industry has one and every four years the Fair Work Commission will update it yeah so it's very um, lawful minimum type of deal Um, happy with that. It's not to say that it's wrong. <laughs> you could eventually get there, I'm sure, but it's probably the least suited to that particular issue. Excellent. Last couple of questions. to price oh you guys that's my bad <laughs> oh my god <laughs> well pretend i clicked red all of you 16 who did red i am so sorry that should have been the correct response you know what there's not a cahoot with me unless one of the answers is wrong at least at least the leadership didn't change my bad with that this one i didn't get wrong Okay, I knew this was going to happen. This happens every time I run. I, I've done this question. This is the fourth time I've run this question in a Kahoot. Um, it is not checking to see if they're of a high quality. It's checking to see if they meet pre-established standards of quality. Okay, pre-established standards. That's the really key part to rem remember about quality control. Alrighty, here we go. Congrats. Oh, Jay, yo, you got dethroned at the last question. Yay! Congratulations. Oh, 8 out of 9, that's really, really good. Wow. Nah, excellent job. Good job, y'all. Okay, so let's jump back and let's just have a break, right? Let's just have a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. We'll do a bit of a case study and then we'll wrap up by talking about the exam a bit more. Yeah? Don't drop out of the Zoom. Just sit and chill for 10 minutes. I'll turn off my video for 10 minutes and I'll set a timer for us as well. There we go. I'll see you guys at 3.50.
Okay, everyone, let's bring it back for a second. So what we're going to do for the next few minutes is just a really quick run through over a case study that applies to um, that last area of study. So um, unit four area study two, implementing change. Now just some quick rules with case studies. You need to know one for each of those areas of study. Like VCAR can ask for any topic, um, for, for you to have a case study related to any of the topics on the study design. So make sure you've got some prepared, scan your textbooks. Your textbooks are filled with different case studies. So have a look at those. Contemporary, because that's the, like what they call contemporary case studies, just means within the last four years, yeah? And it's recommended that you choose, use the same case studies, absolutely. Use the same ones, doesn't matter. <laughs> just use, you can use calls for literally the whole study design if you wanted to, like that's fine. Um, it's just that you find it hard to stretch it that far. So I, it's usually gonna come down to maybe like three or four, three different businesses that you know that you can apply to all the different topics. Just you spread them as far as you can. This one spreads, um, basically into that last area of study. Now, I'm not going to be talking about this one um, because you're probably sick of hearing me talk by now. Yeah, it's been literally nearly two and a half hours. Um, instead, I'm going to get uh, Dim to talk and he's from U UBS. So he's part of the uh, b the business that's sponsoring us today. And he's also like profesh businessman. So he actually has practical experience working in the industry and he studied um, business when he was at university as well. So he's going to be the one chatting um, over the slides for the next few minutes. All righty. Cool. Thanks, Jasmine. Hey. Um, and uh, yeah, good afternoon. And um, well, firstly, thanks, Jasmine. Like these slides are just mint. And um, I wish like I had something like this studying uh, for my year 12 exams, which were a lifetime ago. Um, but yeah, so Jasmine picked a great example for a case study, um, which will go through Qantas. Obviously, the airlines have been, you know, hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, no travel, international or domestic. Um, so I guess what we're going to go, you know, we'll, we'll just go through these slides and, yeah, see exactly how the um, business has reacted to change. So, look, I guess on this slide, we talk on um, exactly what Qantas have done. So, you know, going through all of these, obviously international flights have been grounded until at least the end of October. I, I, I don't think um, it, it may even be longer. Uh, domestic capacity obviously has been cut um, to to nothing <laughs> in essence, um, given that Melbourne and Sydney is the big route. Um, and, you know, that's also still contingent on what happens over the next few months. So probably important to know that, you know, for those first two dot points, um, those are still live um live decisions and you know somewhat out of conscious control on the cost side they have unfortunately had to make six thousand redundancies across australia um as jasmine alluded to before on another cost saving they outsourced a lot of um jobs originally within australia as a as a way of um you know reducing costs and then lastly executive pay cut um, so CEO Alan Joyce was in the press the other day that he's, you know, taken a massive hit on his pay. Um, but I wouldn't worry. He won't be on JobKeeper anytime soon. Um, but yeah, this has been changes that not just Qantas has had to do. Um, but, um, but, but what, you know, many airlines have had to do, uh, just in order to survive. And we've already seen, you know, Virgin, um, fold as a result um, and you know having a couple of friends who work in um, at Qantas you know it's it, it has been a challenging time so talking through the leadership and what um, you know Joyce and the rest have done throughout um, so the first thing that they did was organize a strategy with you know some of Australia's other big brands in terms of um, 
in terms of navigating through the crisis. Um, obviously, with what was going on earlier in the year in retail, um, you know, Woolworths and Coles, Telstra, um, were, were, were faced with a shortage of employees and they used that as a really good opportunity to, um, to, to, to ease the burden on some of their own employees and find them work. Um, you know, next on the need for communication of layoffs, I think one thing that, um, you know, stakeholders, employees, um, clients, uh, your customer base um, wanted was certainty and just um, a plan. Um, you know, I think everyone knew that it was going to be um, hard uh, with COVID, but um, the need for transparency was just that so um, they, they, they would be able to uh, basically, um, you know, try and give um, a good understanding or give everyone just transparency on what their plan was. Um, and, you know, as Jasmine highlighted, something that survived, you know, Virgin didn't, um, it'll be reborn, but uh, important for Qantas to, to go through. Um, we've mentioned the pay cut that Alan Joyce and other executives did. Um, and yeah, again, honest and open communication. And that is for so many different reasons. You know, if you're an employee at Qantas, you want clear communication by your leadership, you know, as you guys would probably want from your schools and your teachers and your principals. Another thing, if you're a customer of Qantas, you want to know what happens with flights, you know, that you've booked. Um, and that, that has been really important. Um, cool. Sweet. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's, let's look through these boxes and just separating them out. So, and this isn't just Qantas, but all businesses are doing this right now. Um, and what we ask over the, uh, the coverage like of the business that we cover from an equity research basis is during this crisis, who can survive? And, you know, revenues aren't going anywhere. You're not going to have people flying more. So how does a business survive? Cut their costs. And, um, you know, COVID-19, Qantas, 5% of total capacity has, um, has meant that they've had to drastically cut costs. Um, their biggest cost base, um, you know, one of their larger, you know, the largest contributions to their cost base is the employees, which they have made cuts, uh, the pay cuts that we've talked about. Um, and, and speaking to someone who used to work in the industry, um, an average seat, um, per, you know, per flight makes only roughly about $5. So just to, just to let you guys know, in terms of how slim the margins are that they're operating on, um, um, it, it is pretty, pretty cutthroat. So, you know, the costs were done basically to save on wages, executive pay cuts, and that also ties into CSR, which we'll talk about. But, um, you know, th these are just part of the strategies that Qantas did to, um, you know, cut costs. On the other end, um, they have tried novel approaches to generate revenue. Um, they are now promoting domestic internal flights to nowhere, um, you know, to keep cash flow running. So seven hour flights, you know, to, 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 um, to some of like Australia's landmark sites uh, that take off and land in the same location just to keep uh, dollars and revenues coming in. And as Jasmine said, just to, um, you know, to survive all with the objective of emerging um, from the pandemic and they will be leaner, but hopefully in a more, um, more, um, more, you know, a, 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 a sector that's probably more um, conducive to doing business going forward. Um, and a more favorable landscape. So yeah, thanks. Just on CSR. So a couple of things that they had done. So Qantas offered voluntary redundancies to employees. And why was this important versus forced redundancies? You know, I guess this is for morale. You know, you'd have within your workforce people who 
were probably nearing the end or close to the end of their careers who'd, who'd probably put their hand up and go, hey, I'll take the cut. You know, I wasn't going to be in the industry longer. And that, that just helps in terms of um, them having to make the hard decisions of forcing um, redundancies on people who didn't want them. Um, you know, and, and also the partnership with Woolworths and Telstra, I think that was very important just to, um, you know, provide some employees with um, continued employment. You know, it, it may not have been in the sky, but it was a paycheck. Um, and, you know, speaking to a friend who is a pilot for Qantas, you know, they've done a really good job in trying to advertise where they can the employee base um, that they have. And I guess lastly, and just touching on JobKeeper, they did offer JobKeeper up for, you know, a number of their employees. It wasn't a compulsory um, undertaking. Unfortunately, though, as Jasmine mentioned to me earlier, and, and this ties into co uh, CSR, um, they have been in the press recently on them trying to withhold some of the JobKeeper payments. And I guess, you know, it's probably not a shining example of them being leaders here, but it does show what the ramifications are when you shirk your JobKeeper responsibilities. By the way, Jasmine, if there's anything you want to add through all of these, feel free. All good for now, all good for now. Great. Okay. All righty, cool. last, last. Oh, do you want me to do it or no? Okay, cool. So I guess, you know, the last one would be modeling all of this in um, the context of Lewin's, um, Lewin's three-stage change model, which I was just refreshed on today. Um, I believe Jasmine did say when you're answering these to make sure that you just firstly state, okay, what does unfreeze mean? But, you know, pretty obvious one here. Um, it was the communication that, look, COVID-19 has happened. There will be an urgent need for Qantas to reshape how they proceed going forward, knowing that um, their top line revenue would be impacted and the priority would shift to long-term survival. Um, and then movement or change. So the actual implement, implic, ah, implementation of the change, um, which would have been the redundancies, um, the shift in strategy, the grounding of flights, um, you know, and, and the various cost saving measures that they employed. Um, and, and just trying to communicate that as best as possible, trying to reduce the inertia and the negative press and the negative, um, you know, the headwinds against, against uh, trying to change out. I mean, Qantas are probably one of the biggest uh, unions within their workforce, and that's something that they are constantly navigating. Um, and then lastly, uh, refreeze. And, you know, the celebration of the cost saving, um, the reinforcement um, um, to the staff, to the stakeholders, and to the shareholders of what they have done. But I guess, you know, the caveat to that is, and just, you know, real life experience that companies will be in constant change. And I'm sure you'd be able to do this whole case study again when we do get to the other side of this um, pandemic and they start to lift flights, um, enter the market and, uh, and try and regain market share. I hope that was a good. Thank, Thank you. you. All righty. So, that was one case study and obviously you need to know more than that you need to know especially for operations management by the way that's like a really important one for you guys to investigate but that's how you do it you apply it to the case study to the concepts that you study now we're going to finish by focusing in on exam strategies and we'll do a bit of time at the end for questions as well so boop, work 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 okay bit of it's I don't know why it says FAQ ranking and scores. Let me get let me adjust something very quickly. Excellent. This is the one thing I wanted to show you. So one quick thing to touch on 
because it's something that I think people talk about a fair bit. It's scaling. Um, and we do Bizman, we do Bizman. If you last year were to get a 30 in Bizman, it would scale down to a 26. Yeah. So we get hit pretty hard by scaling. But as someone who, like, I did six subjects and only one of them scaled up. Um, I did lit and lit scales up by one. I still end up with a 95. So it's it's not like scaling is det can determine your final score. That's not the case at all. And with Bizman in particular, like here are the scores that people get. Most people in a year 12 subject are going to get a 30. 30 is the median, yeah? And then less and less and less people are going to get the higher and higher scores. So if you want a 35 plus, you're in the top quarter of the state. If you want a 40 plus, you're in the top 9% of the state. And if you want 45 plus, you're in the top 2% of the state, okay? So it gets harder and harder to get those raw scores. But the other advantage is that the further you move, the, you move away from that median, the less you're gonna be scaled down. So you could get a 30 in Bizman and it scales to a 26. But last year, if you got a 38, it would have scaled down to a 36. So it would have only scaled down by two. Likewise, if you had have got a 47, a 47 would not have scaled down at all, okay? So the whole principle is the higher your raw score, the less you're gonna be negatively affected by scaling. You have to, I just like, you have to run away from scaling. We pick Bizman where, you know, you're stuck with a subject that does scale down. If you settle for this sort of median zone, what you really want to try and do is maximize your raw score so that you don't get pulled backwards by that scaling. Okay, so brief exam strategies. We're dividing this up into kind of four sections today. Um, just for exam prep stuff in role, in the months before, so this is now, by the way, months before, we're revising our notes, yeah? So we're making sure that we understand, especially like the old unit three stuff and all the little obsolete, like um, subtle bits of subtle topics that we may not recall particularly well, it's that type of stuff. Practice exams as well. At, like they don't have to be under time conditions at the moment because you're kind of in the revision zone, but you can if you want to. However, when we start getting into October, okay, which is pretty soon, I'm talking like we're traveling into October, this is when we really want to start doing our exams in time conditions because time management is so important for Bizman and for every year 12 exam that you do. If you can't finish the exam, you could be the best Bizman student in the state, but if you can't finish the exam, then you're not going to get the best score, okay? So we need to manage our time really well. The night before, jumping ahead a little bit, well, I feel like this goes without being said. Make sure you sleep the night before. There's nothing worse than being stuck doing something important um, when you haven't had much sleep. Um, really, really important stuff, especially if you've got, especially if you're one of the poor souls like I was in year 12 who has the further exam morning. Um, further examination too. We love that. Every single year, every year they put Bizman and Further on the same day, despite the fact that I'm it's pretty easy to say that most people who do Bizman are going to be doing further, not methods or spec. As someone who did Bizman and further, I can attest to it. But Vicar is Vicar, they do whatever they want. We're just chilling the night before, yeah? And then the day of, because it is at 3 p.m., remember? So you do have the whole morning. We don't want to do super intense study, but we can revise our notes. I suggest doing that and make sure you're eating and drinking well as well. Practice exams are so important, guys. They're so, so, so important. Um, complete the exam. If you're doing one, you complete it. And then I want you to mark your own answers. I think that's a really important step because you get familiar with what, like we did that activity before, right? Where you had to like mark the response and a lot of you guys were pretty off. That's a really important skill to have. You need to be able to look at an answer and judge what about this answer earns marks, you know? So it's really good practice to mark your own answers and then get a teacher or a tutor to mark them. Determine which questions and areas you struggled the most in, revise your notes in those areas and then reattempt the question. 
accessible practice exams. That's literally the next slide. That's so funny. Um, bang. <laughs> there we go. First of all, pass VCAR practice exams. Okay. Um, 2017, 18, and 19 are all usable minus a handful of questions. I should have, um, I apologize for not, I, I have versions of the questions that I rewrote that fix those questions. Unfortunately, I didn't put them in the slides, but if I'm trying to think, um, there's, I did, I did this other lecture this morning and those slides do have the fixed questions on them. So I'd be, if you can access those, I think they get uploaded onto a website. I'll, um, it's atarnotes.com, atarnotes. They, my slides will get uploaded to that website and you'll be able to see the fixed versions of those questions. But in terms of like where to find practice exams, um, you can buy a few of them from various different companies, but free ones, you're going to probably depend on your teacher a fair bit, fortunately. Your teachers should have access to lots of exams. If they don't, if, if something happens and you, you don't have access to exams, you do have Bizman ones that go back to 2002, like VCAR ones. You can't do every question, but a lot of those are still applicable questions. Um, and you can email me. I'll put my email in at the end and I'll send you some sneaky resources that I'm technically not allowed to send. <laughs> yeah, I'll chuck my email at the end. How many should you do? The answer is as many as you can. Yeah, as many as you can. Minimum 10 minimum 10 would be my suggestion. That's from my experience studying this subject. You want to do at least half in time conditions, okay? Practice working in under time pressure. So, so, so important. The whole principle is the more the better. The, you do them until you're confident in the content and the questions enough that when you get into the actual exam, you open the exam up and you think, this isn't too bad. This isn't too bad. I've done stuff like this before. Yeah, that's the whole goal, I suppose, of doing so many practice exams. Okay, burnout. Let's talk burnout because, my God, September to November, not a fun period. It's also not a fun period for me um, at uni, so I, I get you. <laughs> um, when you lose motivation, okay, and this is something that I think it happens to a lot of people in year 12. I had a lot of friends who just completely gave up um, in swap back period. We really don't want to do that because it's waste. It's like wasting all of the effort you've put into your work and your studies before now, okay? So we really, really want to push ourselves all the way to the end of the line. I know it's so hard. It's easy to say that, but I promise you, it is two months, it's two months of work and then it's done. You'll never have to worry about types of businesses or management styles or leadership during change. You'll never have to worry about that stuff again, yeah? Pump this one out and then that's it. You can throw this knowledge in the bin. In terms of avoiding that, that burnout of motivation, studying with friends, not illegally, let's zoom y'all. Actually, you guys go back to school. Excellent, do it at school. You can take breaks. It's okay to take breaks. That's fine. Relax. Meditate. It works. I studied it at uni once, so that means it has to be 100% real. Giving up work shifts, especially as we get towards exams. And even things like playing sport and exercising is really, really important. Now, reading time. Let's talk reading time. It's 15 minutes and you cannot pick up your pen. If you touch your pen, you will get a zero. Okay? If they catch you with your pen in your hand, even if you're not writing anything, you're going to get in trouble. So don't touch it. During reading time, it's time to panic if you need to. I say this to everyone. I cry during reading time. That's my crying time. I, um, <laughs> it's, where, it's that time where you can get a bit emotional and concerned about the questions you see in front of you. But get over it in reading time. You shake off the nerves in that 15 minutes. Okay? So that means that you're not wasting any time panicking or stressing during writing time where you just have to be head down writing the whole time. Okay? Take notice of the topics and the task words for each question. And most importantly, plan for difficult questions, especially the 10 marker. Okay? This is prime 10 marker preparation for your, your reading time. Yeah? What if we, oh my God, I actually, so I used to do that with, um, I did that in year 12 psych. I did the, did the nail thing. 
Um, I don't know when they changed the rules or maybe they were never changed, but they actually say on the paper, it's not just like you can't mark, like fill it with a pen. You can't mark the paper. So that includes the, the nail thing. I've done it so many times, <laughs> but yeah, no, unfortunately it's not going to fly in year 12. You can do it at uni though. Heads up. Well, you technically you can't, but no one cares at uni, so it's fine. How fast do we need to write, even for math? Yeah, I know. Like, look, honestly, if you do it, like if you lean over at the right angle, I'm sure you could do it in secret, but you cut just, it probably, it's not worth it. If you get caught and get a zero, just because you're nailing it, yo, that would be tragic as. Now, how fast should I write? We want to write at 1.4 minutes per mark. And that might not mean a whole lot to you, but a sack, a normal sack, 30 marks, one hour, that's about two minutes per mark. So this is 1.4. You're going way faster than what you would in a sack. And this is what you have to do. This is the minimum speed, okay? Because this leaves you 15 minutes at the end of spare time. And that spare time is so important because as someone who missed out on a raw 50 because I misread a question, and it kills me. I mean, like it was like, apart from operations, identify an area of management responsibility. And I was like, cool, operations. And I missed the mark and I could have gotten a roll 50 if I had have just read the paper properly. Use this 15 minutes at the end to go back and read over your responses and read over the questions and fix any of those stupid mistakes that can happen. Yeah, and I, I mentioned this before. Ultimately, you can be the best biz man student in the state, but if you can't finish your exam, it doesn't matter, okay? This happens to so many kids, and I feel awful about it. Kids who work really, really hard, and they're really good at their subjects, but then they struggle with time in the exam, and they flunk it just because they weren't able to finish. And so they have the knowledge of, like, a 45, but they end up with way less because they couldn't finish the exam. It's just one of those things that you really have to learn to cope with. Here are some strategies. I think you should time yourself for every practice question that you do to get used to being under that time pressure, even when you're not doing a practice exam. Use your reading time to plan. I mentioned that before. So important. Maximize your reading time so that you can also maximize your writing time. Be strict with yourself in the exam. Okay. If you set yourself an hour and a half to do section A, that's too long. If you set yourself an hour to do section A, once you're done, once that hour is up, stop and move on. Okay. Watch the clock. Don't lose track of time. That's going to, it's going to go around twice while you're in the exam. And it's, you just, as someone who just struggles reading analog clocks in general, you need to focus on it so that you don't lose track of time. And most importantly, Start with the questions that you can do and come back to the rest later. You have 15 minutes at the end. If you go at 1.4, come, don't waste your time sitting there, head in hands, thinking, I don't know how to answer this question. Forget about it. Move on to one that you do know and answer it so that you don't end up in a situation where you, where you can't finish your exam and you miss out on answering easy questions that you could have answered just because you were sitting there and confused by one that you found too hard, yeah? Here are some task words. Now, all of these task words that I'm about to show you are very basic. The most common task words, by the way, by far, are explain and describe. They come up the most. I think last year there were four explains and six describes, something like that. Um, so, yeah, most common. This is more, again, this will be emailed to you. I'd rather you just focus on that. The ones I do want to look at a little bit more, though, are analyze, justify, and distinguish between. Um, analyze is hard. <laughs> analyze depends on context a little bit. Um, sometimes it's just like break it down in heaps of detail, go really, really into it. But other times it's like a little, it's got little bits of an element of evaluate in it. They want you to show critical thinking and be like, oh, here's some potential positives and negatives. It depends on the question itself. Um, once you do enough practice questions using analyze, you figure it out. You kind of suss, you know, this one's just asking for lots of detail versus this one's asking for a bit of critical thinking. Um, 
there's not much more I can say for that one beyond just practice as many different analyzed questions as possible. Justify, we're linking the strengths of something to the case study, and that's the key, okay? The difference between a two out of four and a four out of four is going to be how well you can link your response to the case study. And then distinguish between, we already spoke about this one, it's at least two differences and showing that you understand what the concepts are. With compare, discuss and evaluate, are we all pretty confident with this one? Compare is, excuse me, compare is similarities and differences, discuss is advantages and disadvantages, and evaluate is the same, except you add a really well justified final opinion at the end. Yeah? Okay, so what we're going to do. 20 minutes. We don't have enough time to go into break rooms. I'm not going to um, stress about doing that the proper way. We have five minutes. We have, because I, you guys need to do that survey at the end as well so that you can get the things emailed out to you. So we have like five minutes now where I want, you can literally just ask anything. I'm really like not fussed. If you want me to go over content, that's fine. If you want me to just talk about exam stuff in general that's fine too but yo I'm not gonna I'm only gonna be here for the next 10 minutes so you might as well ask anything that you want to know um whoop. do you mark practice exams or know anyone that does yeah I do mark practice exams um definitely yeah that's fine I'll like I said I'll drop I'll give you guys my email after this um tips for gat yo gat oh gat's funny um I think you guys need to take it more seriously than past years have just because this year has been whack and we don't know what's going to happen. But with the GAT, there's not a whole lot you can do in advance. Um, link for the evaluation. Yeah, I'll do that. Hold up. Boop, 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 boop. That's the evaluation link. Um, yeah, so you can go ahead and do that. But in terms of like wrapping this up, tips for GAT, the GAT is like... You can't really prep for it. What I do suggest is looking at the past GATs just to get an idea of the types of questions that they ask. But just so you know, with the multiple choice, you cannot prepare for them. They're the types of questions that, like I did so badly in some of those GAT questions because it's like pattern recognition and like weird maths and I just hated it. Um, it it's all it, like there are some artsy questions, there are some Englishy questions, there are some mathy questions, nothing you can actually prepare for. However, there's the other task of the GAT where you have to write a couple of like short essays. Those ones you can prepare for a little bit um, or just at least get used to it. So I suggest like reading over the old GATs and sussing out how we feel about it. Um, do we have any other questions? I feel bad because I usually would do a more like intensive, like I would get you guys into break rooms, but we've just ran a little short on time um, where you can talk about the, basically just talk amongst yourselves a bit about what you don't know and what you do know. Think about any content that you're unsure about or even just something you want me to like for the next few minutes go into more detail for because I'm happy to do that. Oh yeah that's a good idea. Hold on I'll do that. Stop share. Oh my god go away. All right, there we go. Oh, awards and agreements. We didn't really touch on that, did we? So with awards and agreements, okay, you know what? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do something a little sneaky. Um, give me a second. Ah. Pretend you're you're not seeing any of this stuff. I would get in trouble if, if that happened. But I wanted to show you a particular thing and it's this slide here. There we go. So with awards and agreements, um, one of the key, sorry, I thought I just, oh yeah. With the differences between them, one really big one is that awards are something that's set for the entire industry, right? So the Fair Work Commission is going to set an award and it applies to every workplace within the industry, whereas an agreement is something that applies only to a single organisation, 
Yeah, it's just the employees and the employers at that one place deciding on an, an agreement for that one place. We'll have enterprise agreements, yes, that provide for incentives linked to productivity. And the reason, actually, uh, the reason that they um, are incentives linked to productivity, to kind of explain that, it's because agreements go above awards, right? They have to go above awards. That's one of the requirements of an agreement. And so because of that, it means that there's an extra buffer where we can have things like performance related pay put into the agreement. And those things can help, you know, performance related pay does help give people extra motivation um, and extra productivity in order to get that extra bonus or whatever it happens to be. So that has a productivity incentives, whereas awards do not because they're just the legal minimum. Additionally, um, in terms of like, if you had a compare question, a key similarity would be that they both apply to the national employment standards, um, which is obviously really important. I feel like, honestly, those are like the main kind of differences that occur between them. It also comes down to the Fair Work Commission and how they deal with it. So the Fair Work Commission creates the awards, but they only sign off on agreements. Were there any other questions um, based on content or based on the exam that we had for the last five or so minutes? Because I want to maximize what you guys get out of this. Because we and we didn't we didn't manage to get through all of the content on the study design today. So if there's anything from a topic that we didn't touch on, um, trying to think, we didn't really touch on lean management. We didn't touch on many of the materials or tech strategies. It was quite a bit from <laughs> from managing employees. We didn't touch on. If there's anything like that, um, you're welcome to to speak up, and I'm happy to go through it. Oh, goodness me. Oh. I ha oh, my God, I had something to say and now it's gone. Shoot. Oh, okay. One thing I suggest is like with, um, when you are going through and doing practice questions, take note of the ones that people struggle with the most. I've kind of tried to identify some of those areas for you. But areas that people struggle with is things um, like for in past exams, I mean, lean management's one of them. So I suggest really focusing in on lean management. Um, key elements of operations is something that people struggled with, especially with regards to service organizations. So I suggest looking and investigating that further as well. Oh, what else? Things answered badly. One of the things that was answered quite badly but not necessarily because of the content itself was the last question on last year's exam um a lot of people got zero out of i think it was out of four for that one and part of the reason was because like it was it was describe a transition issue and an entitlement of employees okay not too difficult of a question but it really shows how much time management affects people because so many people got zero because they didn't attempt the question, because they never got to it, because they ran out of time, yeah? So really make sure, most important thing before the exam, please make sure that we sort out our time management. Also, handwriting, handwriting. As someone who has seen so much crap, because I, I tutor English as well, so my God, some of the handwriting you see in English essays, Okay, um, like my dad's an examiner and I've seen the screen that he like works off to mark people's uh, Bisman exams. If your handwriting's crap, you're my dad. <laughs> my dad's like eyes don't work, right? You got <laughs> you remember all these examiners are old. You got to be nice to them with your handwriting, okay? If they can't read it, they're going to give you a zero. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think any of us want a zero, okay? Um... Ooh, I think I've <laughs> ran out of things to say. If there's nothing that you guys wanted me to, to touch on, then that's fine. Um, I hope that this was useful, at least. I really hope so. I think before the things that you should really focus on for the upcoming, for your exam would be quality, 
performance management and global considerations, I really think that those will come up. Look, if global considerations doesn't come up, I will be beyond heartbroken, beyond heartbroken. Four years, four years of saying, yeah, it's going to come up in the exam. It's going to be like a four mark question minimum because it's such an easy topic to like discuss. I will be shattered if they go the whole study design without asking a question about global considerations. Okay. What time is it? 429. All right. I think we'll wrap up then there. So I hope that was helpful to people. And also just a reminder with this evaluation, um, you do need to fill in the evaluation in order to get the things delivered to you, the things, the recording and the slides delivered to you. So definitely do that if you haven't done it yet. Here is the link. I put it in the chat. Go do it if you want to collect the recording. But I think that's it. I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you for attending, uh, especially spending a Friday afternoon. Um, I have a lot of respect for you guys for, for using your time like this, especially. I mean, the weather's kind of crap. What else were you going to Netflix? Yeah, I'm going to pump out like five episodes of Haikyuu before I, before I go to bed tonight. But um, yeah, I really, really respect you guys for putting in the effort for coming today. I like, as someone who's, I skipped three classes to do stuff, to do work today. So I'm not in the same position as you. I hope that you do well in, not only in Bizman, but in Gen. And just, whoop. All good? All good? But yeah, uh, so. I don't know what that is. I think it's just a student, but just keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I thought I was like, I can't figure out how to like, but whatever. Anyways, yeah, I hope you all do well, whether it be VCA, this man, whatever. I wish you luck. But that's it. I'll see you guys. Well, probably we won't see. Good luck, everyone. See ya. Oh, I tried waving, but the stupid background thing doesn't work. Bye. Oh, yeah? Are we able to grab your email at all? Sorry? Are we still able to grab your email? Email, email, email. I said email, didn't I? Yeah, no worries. Right. Let me chuck it in. You were saying it in the chat, and I wasn't sure if you were seeing it. I chucked it into the chat. Can you see it? Oh, good. Thank you. All right, no worries. No final questions. We all good? We all good? I don't <laughs> I feel so bad leaving. All right, see you everyone.